All right, lovely people. Time for session number three of my brilliant club catch ups. Um, what do we look at before? We looked at uh, the war up to the end of 1917 in theory, and then took a little look at what the Allies had planned for 1918, which is essentially let the Americans build up their strength. You know, thousands of them would be arriving uh, and the British and the French were pretty tired and weakened from um, having to send troops to Italy uh, and the prospect of a German offensive was looming because they'd be able to bring soldiers over from Russia um, and that is duly what happened. We need to get into it so well, let's go. Uh, battlefield events breaking point uh, is this one. Yeah the war ended in 1918. Well, on the Western Front, anyway. Um, so what's the plan for this one? Well, we may end up talking about that man uh, there, Marshal Foch, uh, Ferdinand Foch, who was a French man. Um, we've got some homework to discuss, in theory as well. If you're one of my brilliant clubbers, um, then yes, hopefully you've had a look at this. <clears throat> if you are not one of my brilliant clubbers, by the way, it's all right. Um, I hope you find some of this useful. A uh, recap from session two, yeah, we'll have a little look at where we were. Uh, 1918 on the battlefield, that'll be a quick fire run through. And essentially you can, you can sort of break down um, 1918's actions into two parts, really. You've got big German offensive at the start of the year and then big allied offensive uh, in, the, in the second half uh, of the year. So we'll chat through that. If we've got time, I'll have a little look at a kind of comparison between um, the Allied offensive on the 1st of July, 1916. That's the opening day, the infantry assault and the Battle of the Somme and the 8th of August, 1918, which is the opening of what we call the, the 100 days offensive. Uh, some animals, because why not? A little bit of levity, we chuck in there. Homework first, though. Now, the task was this, essentially. Um, hopefully, if you're one of my brilliant clubbers, you've got your, your booklet with this map in and um, and a few questions to answer. Uh, and so, you know, if you had a little rumble down the line, uh, the, the scenario uh, was to uh, attack and capture uh, the German second line trench at a little place called Bouchevain um, in early 1917, 4th March 1917. And this was an attack that actually took place. It was British 8th Division that carried out this attack. Um, so, yes, what we'd normally do is in the classroom, we'd have a little discussion around what you thought would be a good idea, how you'd break the barbed wire and things like that. Let's have a rumble through what 8th Division actually did, um, though. So, first thing to say is um, what you don't really get from the map, and it doesn't really matter for the task, to be honest, is um, the, the topography, just the lay of the land. Um, and the British front line, actually, because it's kind of in a dip, um, a bit of a bowl, with the ground going up on the right hand side so on that map where it says 25 brigade uh, actually kind of that side of the battlefield was was up on a hill uh, and the slope kind of goes up uh, as you move away from the british front lines and up towards um the german lines uh, there's the kind of you, you got on the map the kind of little bit of wooded area there that actually extends further up so there's a wooded area off to the left moilan wood and uh, the village of Moila is behind the German uh, lines. So there's, there's a little bit of detail. It doesn't necessarily matter all that much. Um, but what they decided to do was that hill on the kind of right hand side, on the southern flank, um, our, our Major General commanding 8th Division decided to make that one brigade task. And so 25th Brigade, although they're kind of not on attacking on such a wide front as 24th Brigade, um, they've got a challenge because they've got that hill to um, deal with. Now, if they've got two brigades in line, in theory, they've got eight infantry battalions to play with. Now, one of the lessons from uh, the Somme fighting is don't commit all your force straight away because that leaves you with nothing left to command essentially and if you if you're attacking troops get into trouble you've got nothing to send after them and then you call in for reinforcements and then it's just time uh, and and that's not ideal and that extends down every kind of layer of command so if you're a brigadier you may only send two of your battalions forward 
okay if you're a battalion commander you might only send two of your companies forward you might only send one of your companies forward but we'll kind of talk about uh, attack formations in just a second anyway 25th brigade decided to attack with one um infantry battalion in line attacking uh, and another one in support and covering its right flank okay so second royal berkshires um went up into the attack and the second lincolnshires covered the flank and supported okay so that was that was it. i'm going to look at the kind of the, the different roles uh, and, and the order in which they went uh, in just a sec similarly 24th brigade they've got a wider front to attack so they attack with second northampton shears on the left and first worcester shears on the right with the first battalion sherwood foresters supporting both um, battalions and they're using another one of their battalions uh, as the flank guard uh, okay, don't need all of a, a battalion for that, but it's an important job. Uh, and so, you know, in, in one way or another, in different roles, they are using all of their battalions in that brigade, but not all of their force, if you see what I mean. They're, they're keeping some companies spare for different tasks. We'll look at that in a sec. Now, start time was the first question. And with the kind of British front line being down in a dip, and the German front line being up on a rise, it means essentially in daylight, the Germans can see everything the British do, okay? Which means forming up and getting your men into position for this attack had to be done at night, okay? And so they did, all right? They uh, they, they moved everyone out at, at night time. Uh, men needed to be in position by 4.35 a.m. Slight problem with this, <clears throat> it was freezing cold there's no chance of um cutting jump off trenches or anything like that because the ground's rock solid um and so they would just have to form up in in no man's land which made the darkness absolutely crucial thing is they did want some light for the attack which means their zero hour the start time has to be just before the first hint of light in the day okay so the you know just as dawn's about to break bang the artillery bombardment drops um uh, on the enemy front line and then starts creeping forward and that's part of the kind of a tip artillery task we're very much using the creeping barrage as a standard technique uh, at this time so the barrage drops on the enemy front line the infantry advances close as they dare to their own artillery shells bursting in front of them and then when it starts to advance the infantry goes up behind them now the different roles We'll talk about that now. So this is a map, uh, what map diagram pulled from uh, Eighth Division's War Diary. <clears throat> Might be one of the brigade ones actually, but it, it, you know it details the different roles. And if you look at that, you've got the British front line uh, mapped up. You've got the form up points uh, there, and that first wave over the British front line, it, you see it in green. It's the assaulting troops. That makes sense, right? Doesn't it? The the, the assault troops go forward fine nothing wrong with that um the next wave in yellow now these are called moppers up <laughs> they're not cleaners um they're, they're mopping up germans essentially it's their job as the assaulting wave goes over the assault troops are going to stay close behind that bombardment as it creeps forward they don't have time to go and clear out the dugouts uh, of germans who might still be down there uh, and, and so what you, the last thing you want for these assault troops is for them to pass over the first trench line and then Germans to come out of the trenches behind them and shoot them in the back. OK, so these moppers up follow the assault troops and they go down into the dugouts. They move around the trenches looking for the enemy to mop them up, clean them up, clean them out and either take them prisoner or put them out of the combat, let's say. Um, Next troops, that's the black line on that diagram, is a supporting wave, okay? So if that assault wave makes it to the front line, fine, that's a, the first real line of resistance, okay? Then they start moving up, the moppers up, go down and follow them up. Then you've got a support wave, just in case there's a hold up, in case, I don't know, a, a machine gun starts firing or, or there's some resistance at a German strong point, those support troops are there to either help with fire support, um, you know, either suppressing fire or, or to make their way around um, a, a strong point or overwhelm a strong point or something, but they're there to help the assault troops, okay? 
So the support troops follow up next. Now the next wave are holding troops, uh, essentially. So, so these guys are this sort of orange and gray line that you see there. Um, these guys are there to move into the vacated British front line and into the German front line uh, as well, because the assaulting troops are gonna be moving on to the second line. Moppers up are gonna be busy. They don't wanna have to worry about you know, consolidating the position or holding it or, or keeping their eyes open just in case you know, a counterattack develops, something like that. They wanna just get on with their jobs. Okay, so these holding troops then come in to the trench lines just in case something happens. You know, a, a counterattack develops or something like that. They're, they're there to help defeat that. <coughs> Excuse me. Then there's another wave of supporting troops, again, just in case there's a problem. And then that final um, line that you see there, the pink line on there, are the carrying um, troops, the carrying parties. Now, this is vital for defeating the enemy counterattack. Okay, so uh, the, 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 the attack has, has gone ahead, um, they've uh, captured the objective, they've ch captured that, that German second line, Fritz Trench, um, the, uh, they may well have used a lot of their ammunition in doing so, the assaulting troops and the moppers up may have, may have used a lot of theirs as well, they may have used the supporting troops uh, ammunition and so they're all a bit kind of tired, um, they haven't carried a huge amount with them. Um, because they're they're just there for the assault, but the carrying parties are going to bring up ammunition, uh, hand grenades, uh, rifle grenades, drums for the Lewis guns. They're the light machine guns. Um, there's more ammunition, uh, essentially water, potentially barbed wire pickets, um, the, the the screw pickets, the kind of um, the things that you screw into the ground to hold the barbed wire, so have a few of those slung as well. So you'd have hundreds of men coming over as quickly as they could to bring all of this stuff that you're going to need, get the barbed wire uh, wrapped up. This is it. The, the assaulting troops don't then take a break. Okay, it's their job to consolidate the position. They may have some Royal Engineers help, although they might be busy um, attempting to cut a, um, a communication trench between the old British front line and the new captured what was the German um, front line. So everyone's going to be busy making sure that consolidation takes place. Okay, get, get everything in order um, so that when the counterattack comes, which they did expect and did happen, by the way, um, they can defeat it. Okay, and not just capture the ground, but also inflict a lot of casualties. Uh, on the enemy as they counterattack. With all these formations, all these different roles, um, it kind of ties in with, again, you know, learning from the Somme, really. Uh, and, you know, you may have had battalions who uh, in an attack said right okay well we're gonna we're gonna use all our all our force we're gonna have um, all our companies in line A company B company C company D company they're all gonna uh, go in and we're gonna capture the position all right, okay, but if they don't capture the position, you're stuck, okay, because you've then got nothing to come out. Oh, right, we don't have any support troops left. Quick, better get some uh, other battalions. Quick, send a runner um, to, to, to go and call the next battalion up, and it might be 20 minutes before you even get an answer. In the meantime, your men are getting killed out in no man's land, and it's not working, okay? Better idea than having all four uh, companies in line, we're going to have a company as the assault company. All right, they're, they're gonna go up first. B company, we're gonna split in, in two. Uh, and so we're gonna have left flank and right flank protection, okay? C company is gonna be the supporting company. All right, so they're gonna follow A company up and help them if they need to. And D company is gonna be my carrying company. They're gonna carry supplies up uh, as they need. So you know, defining roles like that made a big difference in terms of yeah, making sure you've got some men fresh to, well, to, to launch the attack, first of all, but also uh, in, in making sure the ground was was held against counterattack. Uh, and that's, I guess, one of the features um, that came out of the Somme, particularly that kind of mid-July to mid-September style of fighting. There's going to be a counterattack, and, you know, quite often the Germans would retake the ground, and you've lost a load of men for absolutely nothing. No. Defeating that counterattack, really important. It's kind of, they had a term for it, um, a bite and hold. Okay, this is quite small, small scale bite and hold, uh, really, but you bite, you take a, a chunk of ground off them and then you hold it against the counterattacks. And then when you're ready again, it's another bite. Okay, so uh, there's that. Um, 
just coming back to it, I mean, the artillery coordination, um, yes, this creeping barrage was part of it. Um, prior to the attack, there was wire cutting fire okay so you turn your artillery on uh, the enemy barbed wire to break it up make holes uh, and things they couldn't just do it here if they just wire cut on that front you're effectively telling your germans where you're going to attack and so they had to fire wire cutting shots elsewhere just to sort of sow the seeds of doubt as to where the attack was going to come which means that you know there may have still been parts of this wire which was intact you could have patrols going out at night time uh, with wire cutters you know widening little gaps um, but they couldn't do too much there. That's not the most kind of effective way of wire cutting and, and the enemy would always be watching just in case there were patrols, always be, you know, counter patrolling and, you know, that tussle for no man's land was a real thing. So um, if there were still, there's still a bit too much intact barbed wire on the morning of the attack, they had these things called Bangalore torpedoes uh, as well. And there's a reasonable kind of depiction of how these worked in the movie Saving Private Ryan, actually, which is um, not, you know, it's, it's Second World War, it's not d directly relevant to this, but in terms of showing the principle of the thing, it's, I mean, it, it, in incredibly simple description, you, you, effectively you're talking about a bomb on a stick with a Bangalore torpedo, so you, you got, you know, the, maybe like a, a length of metal pipe, really, but, you know, you, you've got your bomb on a pipe, that you kind of push forward <clears throat> um, towards the enemy wire and then you can attach another pipe to it and then you push that forward and you attach another pipe to it and then you push that forward and you've got a fuse running down and when when you when you bomb when your charge is in position and the end of these pipes uh, you you know you fire the charge and, and hopefully that blows enough of the barbed wire out of the way for your for your troops to to make an entrance okay so there's that for, for, for busting the barbed wire uh, open. As it turns out on the day, they actually did, did fine. Um, the further tasks for the artillery, um, I, I'd be keen to make sure you had some kind of plan for helping um, the infantry de defeat that counterattack. So when the counterattack comes, um, the, the artillery was registered on the, on the kind of support trenches surrounding the objective line. So um, counterattack comes, you've got uh, flare pistols, and usually I have one kind of handy around here, just in case the, the, the German attack. And I've gone and lost it. Anyway, um, flare pistols for signaling. There we go, there it is. Uh, yeah, fire your flares, uh, some kind of pre-arranged signal that isn't quite as simple as one white flare or one red flare because your enemy's probably got that as a signal as well. So different colors for different things, but an SOS is essentially the message. SOS, please drop a bombardment on the approach trenches to our objective. Uh, and so the artillery was ready for that. Okay. <clears throat> Other things, the amount of practice they put in before this. I mean, a few weeks beforehand, 8th Division was given the, the kind of heads up that they were going to be moving into this area and 4th um, and Army Command wanted an attack uh, in this area as well um, because there, were, there, were, there was other things going on. There, were, there was a movement elsewhere. And so, um, yeah, the, the High Command wanted to tie uh, troops into one place to don't have them moving reserves around happily. And so, yeah, they, they um, started planning this attack and got aerial photos of the area. They, they had decent looks at maps and, and looked at the topography uh, itself and found a piece of ground back behind the lines that looked pretty similar, uh, which they then marked out where the trenches were that they were going to attack. And um, so the, the troops themselves practiced and practiced and practiced on replica ground so that when they actually came to the attack itself, they knew exactly where everything was. All right, they're you know, not going to take too many wrong turns. That said, it still wasn't perfect on the day because the artillery fire had been so strong, especially on Fritz Trench, that some of the attacking troops from the Northamptons actually missed it uh, and actually ran over uh, the trench because it had been so badly beaten up. It was just kind of more shell holes, really, and actually ran as far forward as Bremen Trench before realising, hang on a minute, <laughs> this isn't quite right, and having to run back uh, to, to their positions and consolidate there. Okay, um, anything else? Yeah, and I mentioned it was 
freezing cold really really i mean we're talking um just below freezing during the day and uh, and and dropping down to like minus eight minus ten at night so it's icy icy cold and i i you know sometimes put the question um to my groups you know do you think that would be a help or a hindrance and, and most people would say oh it's terrible you're really not going to help the attack <clears throat> at all you're wrong actually it really really helps uh, for a couple for a couple of reasons um i mean with the attack prior to the, the frost setting in um the ground was thick with mud and it's so difficult to move uh in mud whereas when the ground freezes the ground's hard oh we can run on this all right and so actually they, they were waiting for a freeze before launching the attack and up and down the line there's this whole spate of actions in kind of late february early march as as things kick off uh you know the ground freezes and then everyone starts having a go at each other and then and then shortly after there's, there's the withdrawal uh, that takes place the germans withdraw across a whole chunk of, of front um so the, the cold is good news it's actually good news for the wounded uh, as well because you don't bleed as much when um, when you when you're freezing cold um and that's you know your body's kind of you keeping your blood close to your core and everything so if you get you like a wound in the arm or leg you don't bleed as much uh, and actually casualty rates are, are a little bit lower death rates i should say not casualty rates necessarily people are still getting wounded but they're not dying of their wounds they're surviving the journey back to hospital uh, a bit better uh, but that cold did present a problem because like i said the, the men are just, just gonna have to form up in no man's land and there's no way around that um and if say achu <laughs> you know men you're gonna, you're gonna have potentially hundreds of men waiting out in no man's land. all you need is a bit of coughing and the germans are gonna go hang on a minute something's up here a few flares go up ah, there's hundreds of men in no man's land quick shoot them so stealth quiet discipline and not coughing too much <laughs> was um was essential and they realized this beforehand uh, and so yeah that little note on the bottom yes cough sweets they tried to get hold of and then uh, this this is a little note in the war diary uh, as well they tried um to to get hold of a load of cough sweets actually they couldn't get them in time um so the, that note says the divisional commander regrets that the supply of cough lozenges which were being obtained from england in connection with the forthcoming operations has not matured a supply of chewing gum has been issued to 24th and 25th infantry brigades which is hoped will be efficacious useful uh in minimizing coughing on yz night as it turned out it did uh, the, the men <clears throat> stayed undetected, uh, the artillery barrage, barrage went off a treat, um, and uh, the, 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 the ground was clear. There was, there was a lot of fighting, I, I will say, it was very hard fighting for, for that ground, uh, and so when I kind of went there and, and explored the battlefield, uh, particularly around the kind of northern flank uh, area, um, that kind of where, like on the, at the top of the map, um, where the, the, the left flank um, was, I found quite a few bits of... Um, like Mills bomb, um, the, the the hand grenades, like the kind of knobbly bits of metal that you get from you know several of these having been used, probably several hundred of these being used, uh, actually. So it seems a pretty intense bombing fight developed on that left flank there, which you potentially expect. Okay, good. They found some um, three hundred three cartridges as well, spent um, ammunition there too. So it seems like yeah, there was quite a fight for the flanks um, as well. Cool. Oh, there was one other thing, actually. I found a really nice kind of well-done message from the Army commander. Henry Rawlinson was the commander of 4th Army, uh, and he sent really nice messages to the division saying that the, the discipline that you guys maintained in staying undetected in no man's land was absolutely top draw, very well done indeed. Anyway, that's it. So that's the, that's the homework task. And, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to get all of those things necessarily but the point of this was just to kind of show you how complicated planning an attack like this was okay we've just rumbled through it in a few minutes um they had weeks to prepare this on top of all their experience in preparing things like this um so yeah the, the attention to detail is quite a thing at that time where were we uh, in the 1917 okay so we talked about the battle of Combray didn't we so which was you know the, the attack where they used the kind of new artillery techniques and a lot of tanks to crush the barbed wire okay but achieved surprise well done but the Germans then counter-attack and uh, and captured a lot of 
the ground that the British army had captured, uh, which means there's, there's no breakthrough, you know, the, a lot of effort and a lot of loss in 1917, but still no breakthrough for the Allies um, there. The Americans had joined the war, but um, I kind of liken this to um, the British in like early 1915, where their army's still expanding. You got a lot of kind of civilians effectively in uniform. They were very, very new soldiers. <clears throat> and so uh, their performance is not great. And there's not very many of them. OK, so that's that's that. But, you know, the numbers are growing. Russia and revolution, Bolshevik revolution, October, um, it, taking Russia out of the war, meaning that, that Germany can move soldiers to the West. And the Italian second army um, flattened, uh, you know, 300,000 Italians surrendered at Caporetto, disaster. Uh, and so Britain and France sending reinforcements there. French army still not quite up to up to full offensive strength and and their their commander in chief very wary about wasteful attacks patin uh, was was his name uh philippe patin and um yeah so he was always going to be quite cagey about just throwing french soldiers into action very rightly so um but you know there might be some consequences for that uh, britain reducing the amount of infantry in their divisions by a quarter down from 12 uh, battalions down to nine so that they can maintain the same number of uh, divisions out there. Kind of reduces the fighting power of each of these divisions, but industry is kind of making up the difference. Okay, things like tanks um, giving you, you, you wire breaking uh, potential, more light machine guns, just increasing the amount of metal that a, a platoon can kick into the air. All right, so you know there's 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 ways round. You know there there a similar number of men on the Western Front for the British, but they're a lot more in like transport roles, for example, because you go move stuff around. Anyway, yeah, that's where they were. Allies not planning on doing anything in 1918. Okay, wait for the USA to get stronger. <clears throat> Germany completely the opposite mentality. For them, it's. Right, we're moving a load of soldiers over from Russia. The Americans are going to get stronger, but they're not very strong now. The British are tired, the French are tired. Now, okay, now is the chance to win the war. So for spring 1918, uh, but you know, kicking off the, the, the back of their successes in Italy uh, and in Russia as well, where they you know, demolished uh, the, the Russian armies around Riga uh, and captured there. Um, the, demolish the Italian army, they're going to apply similar principles uh, to demolish the tired British and French army. Now, where to attack? We'd potentially have a little discussion um, in the class about you know, kind of what do you think they would target? And, and you're from a strategic point of view, you kind of want to target something important. Um, if you're going to go out you know, hard at the French, well, oh, that's kind of more like where the lines were. That's a dead straight line. It wasn't like that, really. But that bulge had been... Yeah, you know, the, the the German army had pulled back away from that bulge and shortened the line uh, in 1917. So that's a bit more accurate. Um, if you if, you, if you're going to target the French, if you're the Germans, you're going to target the French. Paris is there. <laughs> I mean, and, and not necessarily not necessarily saying the French would have surrendered outright if, if Paris had fallen, but it would certainly weaken them, losing their capital city. Um, there, so so you potentially get a get a surrender from the French. Um, if you're going to go for the British, um, the Channel ports. There. I wish you can't get to London because the, the roads flooded. But um, the Channel ports there are, are where the, the British supply is coming in. And if you if you capture the Channel ports, which are not really that far away from the front lines, then you know you put you put the British in a tough spot, or even. You know, on the way to the Channel ports, um, you've got this, you've got the right rail junction there at Hasbrook. And if you capture that, the British Second Army in this area is in big trouble. Okay. Because, you know, just supply, if you can't get stuff forward to them, you know, they're going to be in trouble. Anyway, um, it kind of depends for the Germans on who they think their major threat is, because in most situations, uh, an army will target what they see as being the, the, the biggest threat to them and um, on this occasion they actually saw the British army uh, as, as the biggest threat so they wanted to target them but they wanted to take the French away from them 
And so they went for kind of option three, 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 three of these uh, ones, which um, is essentially banging down the middle. And um, they wanted to separate the British and French. So they were going to attack the join of the two armies, leaning heaviest on British Fifth Army, which was at that stage the weakest of British, ar of British armies. It also kind of was the furthest away from that very strategic, you know, important site, the Channel Ports uh, up in the north. Uh, and it's essentially where Haig thought he could afford to, to, to put his weakest troops. OK, he his strongest ones up uh, in the north uh, to protect the channel ports and protect, you know, the, the city of Arras and, 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 and Ypres uh, up further north. But he felt he could, you know, if necessary, give ground um, further south. So his, his weakest army was in that area. Um, German plan in a nutshell is blow a hole, um, blast out uh, and create a gap and uh, and then see what happens but probably with the plan of a big right hook uh, and then driving up towards the channel ports once they bust through british fifth army to do that they would need strong artillery strong infantry they didn't use tanks in quite the same way as the, the british and french um it, 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 their attacks would largely be artillery and infantry based and for this they picked their best soldiers out of their kind of regular regiments and created what, 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 what we kind of, well, fancy name, Stormtrooper formations, Sturmtruppen. Uh, it's a lot like Star Wars, of course. Um, and they were given priority for food, priority training, uh, weapons uh, as well, and um, political training as well, for what it's worth. But um, yeah, so these would be the kind of tip of the spear these were the ones that would break through and then keep going essentially and gain as much ground uh, as as they could and yeah carry carry germany to victory um artillery would be a big part uh, of this and i kind of put this in not not because you need to memorize it or anything but just to, to show you kind of the way artillery bombardment worked in in 1918 especially from the german point of view because it's pretty sophisticated actually it's really not just we are going to shoot at their trench lines and then charge um nah uh, you had two i want to say you know significant developers of german artillery technique um you had the fellow who made the guns accurate uh whose name was paul kovsky i think um, and then you got that chap there, um, Georg Bruchmuller, um, who worked out what to target when the guns were accurate. Uh, and so essentially there's a lot of fire on command centers um, and a lot of use of poison gas as well. Because poison gas, although, you know, all sides have reasonably effective, you know, protective methods against them. With all your kind of, you know, protective gear and your masks on and everything you're actually you, communication is quite difficult <clears throat> so slamming command centers with gas and high explosive um, really kind of paralyzes your enemy as well because they you know that's where the orders go out from also um, allied artillery okay that was hit hard by gas and high explosive okay so the gunners have to you know put all their kit on and, and take cover uh, as well thing is they, they start this this is the 21st of march 1918 uh, that this went off um and so they've made all their plans made all their prep 21st of march 4 40 in the morning oh and this is an, the other thing about the bombardment um they don't shoot at the enemy for a week beforehand Okay, because all that does is say we are going to attack you in this area. You know, the, the, the British bombardment uh, for the Somme just telegraphed where the <clears throat> where the attack was going to take place. No, they shorten it and intensify it dramatically. So actually, where where the British fired 1.7 million cannon shells in a week prior to the Somme, they fire double that. They fired about three and a half million cannon shells, but in the space of six hours. Okay, so. It's stunningly intense uh, bombardment but side at 4 40 in the morning targeting yeah a bit of trench line fire uh, but command centers getting getting a heavy beating and the artillery as well the guns now after 50 minutes of that they took the fire off the command centers and the guns and brought the fire onto the trenches 
Okay, now what do the what do the British think when when that happens? Okay, they've stopped shooting at our command centers, they've stopped shooting at our guns, and they're shooting at our trench line. Oh, they must be getting ready to attack. This is it. This is the infantry assault. Right, gunners, get to your guns now. Everyone into the command centers. We're going to hand out orders. Quick, call back to brigade. Call back to divisional HQ. Call back to core HQ. Everyone, you know, we're going to going to hand out orders. Everyone needs to know what to do. Quick, uh, get in. And there's only ten minutes of fire on the trenches, and then they start hitting the command centers and hitting the artillery. Uh, again so everyone who's run back to get into position has put themselves at risk slammed out casualties okay so then they get hit hard again inflicting a lot of casualties and intensifying that paralyzing effect okay it means that the the the, the enemy artillery the british artillery is going to be less effective when it gets firing it means that when the infantry assault comes the the the, the counter attack is going to be disjointed if it comes at all Okay, after a couple of hours uh, of banging away, uh, they then <clears throat> work through some different targeting. Uh, okay, so um, those with infantry support tasks register on the British second line. And this is all observed, left a bit, right a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fire on that line, fire on that line. Yeah, just 10 minutes of that. Then they um, focus on the back of the first positions where you might expect to find some defenders. And then they register on the, the bits behind the lines so that when it comes to the infantry assault, it's right, we're hitting intermediate positions, then we're hitting first defensive, then we're hitting second line. And they're all registered, they're all going to be accurate. And then another you know, two hours, 20 minutes of assigned tasks, largely hitting up strong points. Um, okay, so uh, yeah. It, it, trying to kill as many defenders as they can in their strong points, not necessarily slamming up the trenches, but strong points within the trenches that they've identified. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, over two hours of that. And then just before the assault, the final five minutes, it's every single gun on the front line. Okay, every single gun, every single mortar, every single machine gun being used in a, in a machine gun barrage roll, everything hits the front line. And it's just stunning. And it blew British Fifth Army away. Poor sods. Um, now, this pink blob here in the kind of middle, the biggest of the pink blobs, really, <clears throat> That is the ground gained uh, in those first phases of the assault, because um, that's where they hit. Um, huge territorial gains, driving the British back miles. Fifth Army almost ceases to exist. There's, there's still, it's real credit to, to those men who carry on fighting, actually, because the battalions who are in the front line, you know, they don't have diaries anymore because it all got lost so it's difficult to know precisely the, the order in which things happening but the fact that diaries were lost means a whole battalion headquarters were, were run over and captured um the uh battalions of nominally a thousand men down to their last 50 you know or so still fighting though and still inflicting casualties and that's really important um <clears throat> yeah british fifth army pulverized uh, and the commander was actually sacked which was really quite harsh you know um but hey it, it was felt that someone had to go and uh hey didn't want it to be him <clears throat> now there's different phases now german get, guns get within range of paris not in that kind of initial phase so this started on the 21st of march okay <clears throat> now after a week of frantic advancing um, so the Germans gaining huge amounts of ground. They were starting to slow a little bit just because their supply lines have gotten so long. You know, it's just taking longer for ammunition to get forward to them. And so the Germans think, right, OK, we've stretched the British to breaking point here. Let's attack somewhere else where, you know, we can get supplies to the front uh, a little bit easier. The first time they did this was up at Arras, and they scarcely got out of their trenches, actually, because British Third Army wasn't as weak as British Fifth Army, but the British, uh, the Germans, sorry, had used their best soldiers against Fifth Army, so less good soldiers attacking stronger British armies, okay, and they defend that really well. Uh, in fact, so the Germans think, right, okay, well, let's not do that anymore. Let's move further north again. And so this kind of 
top pink hatched blob uh, thing there. That's the next um, phase. And, and all of this was worrying, I will say that, to the, to the British and French, uh, especially those big gains in the South uh, initially. And it got to the point where um, there, was, there was potentially going to be a split. Okay, British and French armies were potentially uh, going to split. And um, this was at the end of March, um, really. And Haig, the British commander, was knew there would be further attacks on his line. He was desperate not to weaken uh, the British lines if, if, if it were his armies that were going to come under attack. He was desperate for the French to send support <clears throat> round. Trouble was, British Fifth Army was retreating so much that the French army commander, Pétain, was, was thinking, well, hang on a minute, it, it, what are we sending troops to reinforce exactly? If, you, if your soldiers are just going backwards, you're going to have to stop at some point so we can actually you know, reinforce a position. Because if you're just going to keep going, there's no way we can cover all of that ground we're going to you know we're going to be too thin we need to defend paris if, if the if fifth army keeps going we're going to have to make sure paris is defended okay uh, that is panic stations for hay okay so what he did he got in touch with london and and you know spoke to the government spoke to the chief of the imperial general staff in london and, and spoke to whoever he needs to and basically said get out here now we need a conference or something. We need to get the prime minister, French prime minister involved. We need to get higher authorities involved than, than this French fella because he's threatening just to, just to split and, and leave me uh, on my own. If that happens, we potentially lose the war. Okay, so all the kind of high ranking figures, not, not the British Prime Minister, but, but loads of them came out. The Chief of the Imperial General Staff came out and they got the French Prime Minister uh, to a meeting. And basically um, they said, look, yeah, okay, the French will support the British, but what we want is unified command across the whole front under a Frenchman, okay, with a Frenchman in charge. And Haig thought, anything, yes, okay, well, it kind of depends which one. Marshal Foch, it'll be Marshal Ferdinand Foch. And Haig thought, yes, okay, I can, I can work with him. Um, uh, actually, Haig respected Foch uh, a lot and knew that Foch was a fighter. Uh, as well. And so unified command for the Allies, <clears throat> French reinforcements come round, they slow uh, the retreat of Fifth Army, and then the Germans attack elsewhere anyway. So it all got contained at that point. And now the Allies are under unified command as well, which probably they should have been before. But hey, ho. the attacks further north, gained some ground but didn't break through, didn't capture the rail junction at Hasbrook, didn't threaten the channel ports either. And at this point, the, you know, this is now into May. Um, so, we're, you know, Germans have had six weeks bashing away at the British and, and they're, they're not really getting anywhere now. But they've stretched the French out. OK, so now they're thinking, OK, let's hit the French. Quite close to the join with the British again. And let's see if we can split the armies once more and let's go for Paris. So that next big blob down there, these are the attacks at the end of May and beginning of June. Okay. And they do get their biggest guns to within range of Paris. And they do manage to put a few shells on Paris. And that's quite a scary prospect. Okay. But through May and June uh, and into July, uh, the Germans are still attacking Thing is, like I said, they've used a lot of their best troops in their early fighting. So these are their less good troops coming forward. All right. Uh, and when we get to July, it's kind of, they can't do much more. Okay. The, the German troops themselves are, um, like I said, the less good ones, but they're exhausted and they're fed up. <laughs> they haven't broken through the Allies. Okay. So we're there. We're there. No breakthrough. Also, they haven't really captured anything. You know, didn't get the rail junctions. They didn't get the rail junction at Amiens either, further south. Um, they haven't got themselves to Paris. They've captured a lot of fields, but so what? All right, all they've done is stretch themselves out and get loads of them killed. Okay, so about 700,000 casualties the Germans suffer uh, in this process. And the British actually, remarkably, almost make good all of their losses, because they lost hundreds of thousands as well, lots of uh, men captured in those early phases. But they change the rules on who they can recruit back at home, and they also pull men from other theatres uh, as well. Um, men who'd been fighting the Ottoman Empire out in Palestine suddenly come back, and they're thrown in in France 
uh, as well. So the British Army, you know, by July and August, you know, they've not been catching the brunt of things for a couple of months. You know, it was May when they kind of stopped attacking the British. They've replaced the units that they'd lost. British Army's kind of good to go. Uh, actually, when we get to August. And so when the French counterattacks um, at the end of July stop the last German offensive, and this was the, this was known, you know, it, it, telling the, the German soldiers, uh, the high commanders were saying, look, this is the last one, we're going to break through, we'll, we'll, we'll make the French make peace, and then the British will have to make peace. But, you know, one last go, we can do it. This is the peace offensive. All right. And that fails with a massive French counterattack, uh, okay, which stops the attack dead. And at that point, the the freshest, strongest army on the Western Front was was the British. And so, what what was planned out was really quite remarkable because um, the the British obviously want to get their best soldiers in a in a strong location where they think they can really do some damage and so they they effectively bring it to the point where the germans were most extended where they'd gained the most ground against them the british assembled uh, the force of doom um to to to, to bust through they uh, brought their best British divisions down, they moved the Canadian Corps down, the Australian Corps were already in that area, they moved the Cavalry Corps uh, into the Amiens area, and um, uh, 700 odd tanks <laughs> as well, which is more than in the entire uh, rest of the war, um, moved that huge force down, plus about 2,000 aircraft to buzz around and make sure that the Germans uh, couldn't get any observation aircraft over. Uh, they made like wooden tanks and left them up in different parts of the battlefield so that the Germans, you know, might see them and think, all right, they, they, the British have got their tanks up here. All right, let's let's keep an eye on this sector. Um, they left a few Canadian radio operators up around Arras to make the chatter for the for four divisions worth of Canadians. Um, so they think, all right, the Canadians are up here. So that's ooh, we'll keep an eye on this sector uh, as well. And in total Total secrecy. They moved this force down to Amiens, and that the, the the real effort to maintain secrecy was quite a thing. Uh, they had signs up on the roads, literally saying "Keep your mouth shut." All right. So the, the security element was a was a serious serious point. And then using the same artillery techniques or similar techniques to what they'd used at Cambrai, where they'd achieved surprise, all of a sudden massive bombardment drops on the German line, hundreds of tanks supported by the top, top infantry um, from the British Empire uh, advance forward. And they gained about eight miles um, on that day and blew the German lines open. And it's, it, I wanna say it's not quite panic stations for the Germans just yet because they're starting to move reserves in. But before um, the reserves are all set, another attack goes off. And, you know, by this time, the unified command meant that Foch could just decide where to where to, where to to play it. So fourth, fourth Army, uh, British Fourth Army in the lead on that one with, with the French in support, and then all of a sudden a French attack somewhere else. And then British Third Army uh, goes into the attack, and Fourth Army's ready again. So Fourth Army goes to set another French attack, then the Americans attack, and then British Second Army uh, attacks. And by this time, the German army, I mean, it's like being, it's like, fighting a boxer with eight arms, uh, essentially. You can't block everything. And so they're taking hits and they're going backwards. End of September, British, American, Australian troops break the Hindenburg line, the Siegfried Stelling, and they crack it and, and pour men through it. And at that point, the Germans have got no strong defensive lines to fall back on. And that's when German army command gets in touch with the German government and says, yeah, we need peace now. Um, we can't win this. So, although there's still a bit of fighting still to do, um, you know, and, and it presses on, um, that sets in motion a chain of events in Germany, which leads to um, the surrender. And we'll talk about that in the next session. Animals. Now, I, I would what I would normally do in the classroom is throw out yeah kind of what animals took part in the in the great war horses and mules and donkeys obviously vital for transport i know um you know cavalry whatever you know they they they're there as well but you know the, the bulk of the horses and you know uh, transport animals like that were were for transport and so it's huge numbers of them the, the british alone lost about half a million horses um and mules and donkeys in the course of the war 
dog there that looks like a medical dog receiving some medical attention um uh, on the on the that french man um looking very french with his cigarette and glasses um but yeah uh dogs are used for they could find men in no man's land they could kill rats in the trenches um lots of uses for dogs they carry messages messages uh, as well i think the germans were slightly more prolific than the allies in terms of using messenger dogs i think they used about ten thousand of those uh camels not so much on the western front um but certainly out in palestine and in very hot climates where um uh, the the war against the ottoman empire was going on uh, we had the camel corps uh that is um a, a baboon <laughs> <laughs> this is um, Jackie, Corporal Jackie. Corporal Jackie. Imagine being outranked by a baboon. Um, yeah, he was the mascot for the uh, third regiment, the South African uh, infantry. Um, there's quite a lot of mascots out there. That's that's one of the more famous ones. The fourth regiment, South African infantry, had a springbok, um, uh, which they brought around with them. Um, yeah, but there's various other regimental mascots, you know, sheep and goats and, and things like that. Uh, pigeons, I don't know anything we think we mentioned messenger pigeons at some point when we were talking about communications, but yeah, uh, it could be vital. And um, never forget the, uh, the the brave pigeon of Fort Vaux, uh, Verdun, um, who, who carried the, the kind of message of misery from uh, from the defenders of Verdun, pleading for help from the citadel, which never never arrived, and the uh, and, the, and the, the fort was captured by the Germans. They gave the pigeon a bravery medal though. Um, on the right hand side, us a cat. I don't think they had many serious military uses. I don't even think they scared the rats away very much, but they're kind of nice to screw. Uh, and that picture down in the bottom middle is canaries. And these were used in the tunneling side of things. So you're tunneling underneath your enemy positions. It's quite dangerous work because it could be kind of collapses and things. But actually, uh, one of the real concerns was the amount of oxygen uh, that was reaching down into the into the tunnels. And you'd have sort of pumps going, but sometimes these would break or not work, or there'd be a hole in the airline or something like that, or you'd hit a pocket of gas or something. Either way, sometimes your oxygen levels in the tunnel could drop. Now, little animals like a little canary or a mouse. Uh, very sensitive to um, drops in oxygen okay so they'll die before a human does okay so if your canary falls off the perch dead canary you think right okay it's not safe down here let's get out let's check the oxygen supply and let's let's get a new canary because this one has expired there you go homework there is some uh if you're one of my brilliant clubbers um now, what you have in your booklets are um, three sources. Um, uh, can't remember what they are uh, now, but I think one of them is from is a statistical one. Uh, I think there's a, a Gary Sheffield quote about infantry tactics. Um, I think there might be another one which mentions Marshall Foch. Um, but if you can find your own stuff, then don't mind that. Uh, at all essentially three short paragraphs a couple of sentences in each one uh, each picking a different aspect of progress okay progress in probably easiest with the british armies to describe but if you want to sort of discuss with the, with the french or or the other allies uh, progress how they got better how they got stronger uh, between 1916 and 1918 and this is not an online submission thing this is just to form the basis of a chat okay but yeah like i said you, if you want them a brilliant club you've got your little booklet and you, sh you should have some space to to write these out and um and we will chat through them if you are going to be joining in the actual classroom otherwise uh, next video will go through some things that i've written down all right so that's the session i hope it was useful and if you're not one of my brilliant clubbers still hope it was useful <laughs>